Shalom, and welcome back to <clears throat> our class on Nevi'im and Ketuvim, the Bible stories. And we're up to the second book of Samuel, of Shmuel, chapter 7. And the chapter begins with David saying the following. If we look at verse 1 and 2, everything was fine. He finally was settled. Remember, he unified the kingdom and, uh, and his... Uh, his enemies are quiet, you know, he's defeated them. And he turns to Natan the prophet and he says, I am sitting in my Beit Arazim, which is my house, my big palace. And God is abiding in a tent. And that just does not seem right. So let's think about for a second what it means that David is sitting in his Beit Arazim in his house. So if we look up, uh, we see that David actually wrote a song. It says the following, a song when he dedicated his house. Rabbi Ibn Ezra says, that's when he did that Beit Arazim. In other words, that house that he made for himself. What house did David make him for himself? I'm glad you asked. So in order to understand this, we go to a very interesting website where uh, it gives us some um, pictures of the city of David. And the city of David is conquered by David, and that's why it's called the city of David. And there was this big, it was a Canaanite city, or Jebusite city, that had these huge walls all around it, okay? And by the way, th there's a valley here, this is called the Kidron Valley, and there's another valley here called the Central Valley. And these valleys, of course, geography doesn't change much, so these valleys still exist today. The city still exists, but of course the walls are all gone. Not all the walls, because there are remnants, and that's what the archaeology of 1967 till today taught us. And on the bot, the top of it, up above that even, to the north of that, that's where we're going to talk about the Beit HaMikdash uh, when we get there, the temple. But below that is the fortress and David's palace. This is an assumption. But we'll have to try to figure out, if, do, uh, did we find any archaeological evidence for David's palace? Certainly in the Bible, it says that he has this house. Here's another depiction. Of course, this is, these are just uh, drawings um, with the, the house and the fortress at the top. If you look carefully here, there's a stepstone structure, a lot of steps. Um, that we uncovered, a woman named Kathleen Kenyon uh, uncovered it around 50 years ago. And it looks like it's supporting this major um, house or fortress or, or palace, okay? So we'll have to think about that. And here it is again, this, this we have uncovered in, um, in the city of David. If you go there, you will see this. And this is very strange because this is only the, the logical reason that you would spend so much time and effort is to support something that's merely magnificent on the top here. Okay. Um, another view of it, once again, the Kidron Valley, the Central Valley, and the palace on the top. Okay. And Mount Moria all the way on the top of that. And this is what it looks like today. Okay. And here is the same Kidron Valley. And here is the Central Valley. In the Central Valley, there are already Arab houses. But in the Kidron Valley, there are none because it's probably in the creek. It's in the middle. It's still used you know, when it rains in the middle here. And the top is Mount Moria, where now the, obviously the, uh, the dome is. And in the middle of this V here, this is the city of David, OK? Um, here's another view, and um, so that's a cool way to see what we're talking about. Now, the question is, did they find anything that can corroborate that this is the palace of um, King David? And this, I want to show you a YouTube video for a few minutes. So settle in, and we can learn about an interesting the site. David, just within the last couple of decades, they've done some great archaeological work there, and they think they've uncovered part of King David's palace. Here, once again, the current the, uh, modern Jerusalem just the, sprawls the Kidron all Valley. across these valleys. Most people, when they enter the city, they have this picture of this bird's eye view from the Mount of Olives looking down, and you see the Temple Mount. But that wasn't there with the city of David. 
talking less than 3,000 people. And so really with the city of David, you have this seed of Israel starting as a nation and growing out from its capital. We are in the city of David, the true location of the ancient biblical Jerusalem. And you can see around us the tourists coming, just exploring again this active amazing Active place. Spot. It's a very Absolutely. active place. We are standing in the palace area. Up to 150 years ago, we didn't know where the city was. Everybody thought that the ancient biblical Jerusalem lies within the confines of the old city. It's only when Charles Warren by accident came and he discovered the place that he realized, but listen, this is the actual location of the ancient city. Archaeologically, how do you establish that this was the palace? How do we know that? We cannot say 100% that this is the palace. Right. This is how archaeology works. Right. Unless you find something that is written, David was here, right. you cannot say that. Right. In Lat Mazar, she came and she said to us, guys, I think that this is the location of the palace of King David, and we need to dig down. And we said to her, but we did dig down. She said, you didn't dig deep enough. And we said to her, okay, we are willing to go, but you have to tell us why. And she said to us, 60 years ago, a woman named named Kathleen Kenyon found a capital broken into in a landslide and that capital is a Phoenician style. And Phoenicia is the modern day Lebanon. It dates back 3,000 years and when I opened my Bible she said I read about a king Hiram of Tyre and he came and he helped David to build his house. Solomon to build his house and to ultimately to build the house of God. The second thing is we found houses built into the walls of the ancient city dating back to the first temple period. And that means that we are very close to some kind of citadel here. Within those houses we found furniture and that furniture dates back 3,000 years. The third reason is the city itself lies between two valleys. We have the Kidron Valley, you guys can see it on that side, and at the back of me another. Between these valleys, we have the city situated. Very difficult to take the city. So difficult that the Jebusite king said, uh-uh, not gonna happen. In Lat Mazar, she said, on the north side, it is level. It means that you're gonna have to put something here to keep the city safe. Yeah. She came with her Bible in hand and kept reading it and referring to it and looking for reference points and kept finding those reference points as she dug. I think that's very important. If you want to find the Bible and what's written in the Bible, you have to go to the Bible, that's right. right? Well, I'm very grateful for her approach. So are we. Very grateful. <laughs> what's going on currently around this site? full-time excavations going on all the time. We started the project with the name Jerusalem Watch, and through that people can actually support the excavation team. You can become part of getting the buckets on the ground so that we can absolutely expose the complete blueprint of the city to the world. So we have a big building, right? How do we say that it's the palace? In 2005, we found a very important seal. Three years later, we also found another seal. And these two seals are very, very important. Two seals that appears in the same book in the Bible, Jeremiah, in the same chapter, in the same verse, back to back to each other. Gedalia ben Pashur, Yuchal ben Shelemiel. Written in the Bible, written on the seals. So that tells us that we are in the governmental area of that time. The time of King David dates back 3,000 years. The time of these guys, 2,800 years. And we know that in that time, this was the governmental seat of the city itself. How does it make you feel to stand in a place like this where such an important point in Israel's history happens? This city brings the Bible to life 300 and 60 degrees. The city of David, Jerusalem itself, leads in the fact that there is unequivocal proof that there is a connection to the Bible. Okay, wow, that was fun. Um, we are continuing. Here I am. Okay, so uh, that kind of uh, brought it to life a little bit. I'm sorry uh, for some of you watching that you felt bad that you can't be in Israel. Uh, the city of David is the most important uh, archaeological site and uh, um, because when we're reading the books about da King David and about how he founds this city and how from there uh, all of these uh, events that we're going to be reading right now are taking place. And we rem remember 
<laughs> in a few chapters from now that the city of David is on a hill and David's house is at the top of the hill. And that would make sense. The, he's the, the king, it should be most fortified. And um, therefore he's able to see everything that goes down the hill of, of the city of David. Anyway, um, in chapter two, in chapter seven in the second book, as we said, David wants, he feels bad. He's got his beautiful house that he's built, that he had Hiram, the king of Tyre, helped build. But the temple or, or the ark is in a tent. So shouldn't there be a, uh, a place for the temple, a house for the temple? So um, Natan answers affirmatively. He says, whatever is in your heart, you should do because God is with you. But in the middle of the night, uh, God appears to Natan and says the following, go tell David. Um, are you the one to build a house for me to dwell in? From the day that I brought the people out of Egypt, I have not dwelt in a house. I've moved around in a tent in a tabernacle. As I moved about wherever the Israelis went, whom I appointed to care for my people, why have you not built me a house of cedar? I took you from the pasture, from the flock, to be the ruler of my people, and I've been with you from wherever you went, and have cut down all your enemies before you. Moreover, I will give you the great renown, the greatest of men. I will establish my home for my people and plant them firm so that they'll be there. Um, so it, this is a strange prophecy because it sounds like David is being told by God that he will, in fact, build this temple. But look what happens in the last line. And he says, I haven't had a place to dwell and you're going to, uh, you know, this is the place, this is the time and you're the one. And then verse 12, it says, when your days are done and you lie with your fathers, you pass away, then I will establish your seed after you that which comes from your seed, and I will establish him on the throne. And verse 13, he will build the house for my name and establish his royal throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. And my you know, kindness and my pleasure and my favorable towards him will never cease. The Neman Beitcha and your house will be faithful, and your monarchy will be forever, and your throne will be forever eternal. All of these things God told Natan, and Natan told David. So it sounds like from this section that God is very positive. He's saying, yes, you deserve to build the house. It's just that your son is going to do it, which is a very nice way of looking at it. In other words, you prepare, you, you, you know, prepare the whole city and prepare the people. And, you know, you're getting on in years. So there's going to come a time. And don't worry, your son is going to build the temple. Um, there's another verse, and we'll look at that verse another time, which said that God actually said, no, 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 David, you can't build a, te a temple. Your, only your son can. You can't because you have blood in your hands. Your son will because he has no blood in his hands. That's not the message here. The message here is, yes, David, you can through your son. So you see, it's a bit of a nuance is David walking away from this feeling like, wow, this is so great. God gave me this honor and the honor will be through my son. Or is he saying, oh, that's so unfortunate that I'm not going to be able to do it. My son is going to be able to do it. Now, there is a response in verse 18. King David came and sat before the Lord and he said, what am I, Lord? What is my family that you've brought me this far? In other words, it sounds like he's saying, I'm, I'm not worthy. Um... Weird. 
Uh, he sounds like he's saying, I'm not, I'm not worthy. And um, David keeps going and saying, verse 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. In other words, the entire rest of the chapter, David is um, praising God for the, uh, what he has done for him so far and for what is going to take place. So this is a very different view than what, as I said, mentioned in the book of Chronicles, that David is kind of uh, maybe upset that he's not going to be able to build it here. It sounds like David is, is very excited and he's welcoming the, uh, the um, prophecy. And he's saying, this is going to show how my kingdom is going to be established and it's going to stay forever. And I'm going to continue verse 26 to uh, glorify your name. And I'm going to, my house is going to be, you know, of a fulfillment uh, of, of this, uh, establishing this house forever. Um, you uh, have, you know, opened your ear or, or, you know, revealed your ear of your servant saying, I will build your house. And therefore I am praying to you this prayer. And therefore God, you are the king, God and your words are true, and you've spoken to me this goodness, and therefore I will bless you forever and uh, make sure that um, this house will, will, will stay in your, in your blessing at all times. That's a beautiful prayer. Um, David here was waxing a bit poetic, which he usually saves for the book of Psalms, but here he, it is inserted in um, this book, uh, as if to say that he's overwhelmed with emotion, even in the, the prose, even in his, in his stories, here his emotions are such that it would be the pin of, pinnacle of his spiritual existence if he was able to build the house of God. And as I said, it seems to me that it sounds from David that he is building the house of God through his son and his legacy. Um, excuse me, let me just go to chapter eight. Ah. So that chapter is completely a spiritual chapter, a chapter of David's understanding his role of establishing the throne of God, of establishing, you know, he doesn't have to worry about the king aspect of, of um, fighting against his enemies. He'll do that in this chapter, but it, there was like an interlude, okay? And this is the beauty of David, that, that in the midst of his... Um, hold on. Yes, I'm sorry. In the midst of his, uh, um, his fighting and his politics and things going on in his kingdom, David finds a time to say, I want to build the house of God. It's keeping yourself centered on what is most important. And it's surrounded by the things that are most urgent. I once learned a long time ago that a good leader has to figure out the importance uh, of the difference between things that are important and things that are urgent or imperative. Um, you could spend all your life dealing with things that are urgent, but never think about things that are important because you're putting out fires, because you're dealing with these people, because you can do that a whole life. Alternatively, you can just have your head in the clouds and think about things that are important and never deal with you know, the stuff at hand. The key to living a good existence is finding that balance between important and imperative. Anyway, David uh, goes back to reality and um, fights wars because that's what's expected of the king. That's what the people wanted the, from their king. And that's exactly what he did. Verse one, he smites the Philistines and defeats them. 
and renders them impotent. That is one verse which tells a whole story, right? Because he has history with the Philistines. He had a friendship with the Philistine king, one of them. We don't know, it doesn't tell us enough about it, but he did it. Um, he needed to do it for his kingdom and he did. The second verse, he defeats Moab. That's on his Eastern front. And he uh, basically put them to death in, in this weird way of, that they used to do in the times of, uh, of war. In those days, they had a, a string and if you were above it, they killed you, if you're below it, there's different types of ways that they showed or humiliated their enemies, okay? And then in verse three, he defeated the king of Tsova uh, on the Euphrates. That's even further away. Okay, Hadad Ezer. And he, um, he amassed a, a large army uh, and uh, weapons as a result, 1,700 um, horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. Um, uh, and chariots. And Aram came from Damascus, from Syria, to fight Hadarezer, and David defeated him too, 22,000 people. David stationed garrisons in uh, as far north east as Damascus, and the Arameans became the tributary vassals of David. We're going to learn more about this later on. A vassal is, and tributary means you pay a tribute, you pay a tax for basically being in control, but then David let them live their lives. Um, those who were immediately posing a threat, David killed. Those were, who were part of his spheres of influence, he defeated and he uh, set them up as a uh, tax tributary. So this chapter is really, these two chapters, right? One talking about the spiritual dimension that what's important for the people to see is that he cared about housing the Ark of God. And obviously the people would care more about chapter eight in which he talked about, uh, or it talks about what he accomplished in terms of wealth, in terms of security, in terms of uh, comfort and uh, quality of life. Um, he took a lot of copper from Betach and Beiroti uh, from the cities of Hadadezer. Um, and um, and then what happens is once you have developed a name for yourself, so then To'i, the king of Hamat in verse nine, found out, saw what's going on, that David is, is so powerful. So he decides to send his son Yoram to seek peace. In other words, once you've developed yourself that you are a serious force to be reckoned with, so then some enemies will say, let's fight. And some enemies will be smart and they'll say, Let's uh, be allies. And that's exactly what happens in verse 10. Um, he says, he blesses him, he wishes him well, and he heard that about the battle and that he defeated the king of, uh, of Hadadezer. Um, um, and he, all the wealth that he had. And he received all this wealth and he, look at this, verse 11, he sanctified it to the temple. He gave it to God. He, 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 he um, um, dedicated these to the Lord, which is also a, an important thing for David to realize that the wealth should not be for the king. The wealth should be for the king, for God. Okay. Um, and from Aram and Moab and Ammon and Plishtim and from Am Amalek and Hadad Ezer, all of these, he uh, amassed enormous amounts of wealth. Um, and in verse 13, David made, gained fame. He made a name for himself after defeating Edom in the Valley of Salt. And um, Edom became slaves to David. David, uh, uh, God saved David or supported David in everything that he did. Now, um, this is a, a very, very powerful, you know, and 
in a few short chapters, his life is going to take a, a horrible turn for the worse. And because of his sins, and we're going to discuss it, but we shouldn't ignore and we shouldn't skip this uh, in too quick a fashion, this vital aspect of his life. This is in one chapter, it speaks about all the wars. You know, as we're talking about David as a major success, major victor, a major leader, one who gained fame, but always knew what to do with that fame, at least until, you know, at this point, um, he seems to have no flaws, okay? Um, once again, chapters coming up where we'll learn about his flaw, but right now, even the wealth did not seduce him. The wealth turned him to direct it towards the temple. Um, and not only that, in verse 15, which, you know, if I had to think what is the pinnacle of David's um, career, it might say ver verse 15, right? So that, why am I saying that? Because we've already read chapter seven in which he talked about the spiritual th thing, but that's very personal for him to build. And then chapter eight, in which he talked about the national and the name that he has and the recognition and the fame and how everything is, uh, um, you know, going in his way and God is following him. Um, so that sounds great. And we've learned previously of how important it was for David to unify the people. But the question about a king is and the threat and the danger of a king, and we saw this with King Saul, right, is A, to become influenced by the people, and then you're not in control, or B, to be swept away by the wealth and be seduced by that, or C, to be engaged too much in um, treaties or, or allies and marriages for, for, uh, for convenience and for allies and these type of things. All these things can deter you from your connection to God and your responsibility to your nation. And forget about that, the responsibility that you have to your nation. And here in one verse, in verse 15, we're reminded that everything that David has done so far and all the fame and all the wealth has not gone to his head. Instead, he's very, very focused. He's very um, grounded. And he says the following, David and David was the king over all of Israel. David And David would do um, justice, true justice, or mishpat means judgment, and staka means Spravlivosh means justice to all of his nation. Now, it's a very quick and easy uh, um, sentence or verse, but how heavy and profound is this idea that David is able to um, render justice, render judgment to an entire nation, that they recognized that what he was doing, because he acted overtly, and this is also important, he, he was very open to everyone, and he showed people what he was doing, he took the money and he used it for the temple or for, for sanctifying God, and he used it for his nation, then it was seen, and this is the high point of his life, that um, all that he did, he did for God and for his nation. And in verse 16, it says, and these were the people that were in his circle. His chief of staff was Yoav, the son of Tsuriya. Remember him. He was always by David's side, but he also killed Avner Ben-Ner. So he's a complicated, a complex individual. Yehoshaphat, he is the mazkir. He's kind of like the uh, recorded everything. He must have written it down. Tzadok and Achimelech. Remember Achimelech? Achimelech was the last one of the 
priests that wasn't killed that David took under his wing. Okay, so these there everyone has to have his, you know, the king has his priests. Usraya Sofer. And um, obviously you needed a scribe. And Benaya ben Yehoyada was in charge of the Krati and Plati. This is a complicated idea. Some say it refers to uh, people, like he's in charge of these type of people. But, but in, the, in Talmudic parlance, the Krati and Plati are the uh, spiritual um, um, kind of vehicles, like, like prophets, that uh, were able to tell David what he needed to do and when, what God expected of him. Uvnei David kohanim hayu. And the sons of David were priests. In this regard, priests doesn't mean that they were from the priestly family. We know that David wasn't a priest. He was from the tribe of Judah. What it means is that they were servants and that they, were, they served in, in, in a spiritual capacity and that they were um, there to, to give of their time to the nation. So I think that this is a good place to stop. And this leads us to uh, the next chapters, chapters nine and 10, which will um, be uh, the next uh, discussion that we'll have. It'll be interesting. As I said, we reach a pinnacle, we reach a high point. And unfortunately, from that, we're going to have to watch David falter. And uh, we're going to have to learn about David, not only from his greatness, from his heights, from his success, from his consistent uh, supporting and, uh, and serving God, but also when he falls, he falls hard. We're going to have to learn what, uh, how that works out and what that's about. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a uh, wonderful day. In this case, context, have a uh, Hanukkah Sameach. And we will continue next week. Oh, thanks, Rabbi Haksameach. Thank you, Haksameach.